All right, here we are again. Uh, figured I would throw you guys a fairly simple little uh, presentation on uh, fixing wires. I got a story or two to tell, and uh, let's see if we can get into this thing so we can get it done in our allotted time. Uh, the thing that a lot of people that grew up in rural areas used to do would be to take some of these scotch locks and they would put their uh, trailer tow package on there. They just find the wire going to the tail lights at each turn signal and they'd bite into those things and they'd pull the wire down there and have their little fork, you know, their little flat plug. And um, I started running into situations on vehicles. The first was on a Bronco 2 that had one of those little nondescript vehicle things down there at the tail when the lights went out. Well, the wires, there were, there were resistor wires in there. And the problem with the resistor wires being there was what they would do is uh, it would burn the wires up because the trailer was actually causing extra current on those. But even if you don't have that little, those little uh, voltage drop designed to resistor wires like they had in the 80s on those Bronco 2s, like I was talking about, there was a... These situation is this 95 Thunderbird, which I've you know got pictured right there, exactly that color. And this guy had put him some lights on that thing, brand new vehicle now, and he scotch locked into the brown wire, uh, you know, for his tail lights and then the other ones. And he knew how to do this because he was an old school kind of a guy. And he pulled a boat all the way down to West Bay or somewhere to go fishing. And whenever he got down there and he tried to switch the car off the lights stayed on and the car wouldn't switch off it was still running when he switched off the key and so he got it back up there uh, he had driven all night long with those lights on uh, and those extra trailer lights being pulled from that little uh, brown 22 gauge wire and uh, it was a nasty mess he applied the scotch lock way back here and what happened was it melted that wire harness it started melting going back toward the power source like it does. Started at the scotch lock. And that all those wires that were carrying that current, uh, they got hot. It's like a slow burning fuse. It went all the way back up here. It went over underneath the dash to here. And that harness also on that 95 Thunderbird goes out under the door. So I had to gut the whole car, had to change that entire harness because fixing it was just not even an option because there were wires melted into other wires and all kinds of stuff. This was a $3,000 repair because he did his um, little scotch lock the old fashioned way. And these vehicle manufacturers aren't going to put wires any bigger than they need to in there nowadays. There was a time when they did, but they don't do that anymore. They put the smallest wire they possibly can to save weight and money and everything else. And so you just got to be careful whenever you're doing something like that. Now, 22 gauge wire, if you look at this little size range here, it tells you what size each one of these gauges of wire are. All right, and that 22 gauge uh, is just very small, 25 thousandths of an inch. And that's, small, that's less than a spark plug gap. Think about the size of that wire, the copper wire that's in there, less than a spark plug gap. And you, that's obviously not going to carry very much of a load. Well, you got to burn this in. You understand how relays work. Uh, whenever you put power and ground here, these contacts go together and that puts this one and this one there. If you let the relay do the heavy lifting and the little faint little circuit that's 22 gauge wire operate the relay, then you're a whole lot better off because the relay is actually doing the, the muscle. Now you do have to pull fused power from somewhere to feed the relay so that it has enough strength to carry the load. That's really important to do that. Uh, adding loads, and I've seen this on uh, Ford pickup trucks when I was working at Ford dealership. People would add a bunch of uh, maybe cab lights. They'd add these lights down the running boards and they would just find that brown wire up under the truck and they would scotch lock into it. Now it's going to find the weakest link in the chain. If that happens to be the wire, the wire is going to melt. In these particular cases on the pickup trucks, usually what I would see would have burned out headlight switch, just like that right there. Uh, you know, there'd be that the one that was going out to those lights would you know, cook the switch, then you had to put a, a new uh, pigtail in there and a new headlight switch and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I don't know how many of those I saw. 
Also on motorhomes, there were uh, these motorhomes for a while came out. They had the little plastic stoplight switches that were so crummy and cheap. They were on some of the older Ford vehicles. Well, the uh, F-53 chassis motorhomes came out with those same dadgum cheap uh, switches. And they have these great big massive lights on the back for stoplights. And it would burn that switch out and they'd lose their stoplights. And so what would happen was I would take that uh, stoplight switch and I would replace it. And of course, they eventually came out with a more robust switch they had us putting them on there. But I would take their, this, before they did that, and I'd put a relay under there, usually like a fuel pump relay with a big tail that you get in the parts room. And I would let the stoplight switch close the relay. And then I would let the power that was, you know, originally powered up the stoplight switch uh, power up the uh, relay uh, common terminal or the normally open, whichever you decide to do, it don't matter in that case. And then I'd ground the coil on the other side. And when they mashed the brake, they'd hear that relay click, but it was doing the heavy lifting and they didn't burn things out that way. Um, okay, so the factory on this truck, you might notice for marker lamps and all, had a relay right here to under the trailer adapter. Now, some of them only put a relay pull in the marker lamps, but they let the turn signals, you know, be carried by the existing wiring. Uh, personally, I don't like that. Most of the time, if you put a trailer tow package on one, it's not going to be like that. It's going to have a relay for everything. Um, but in this particular case, the way they wired it up was like that. Now, here's a little story. <laughs> uh, back in 95, when explorers like this one here behind me were brand new, uh, I got one that was still under warranty that the people had driven it to uh, Tennessee. They drove all night long. And this was a brand new vehicle. Now there's no reason why they shouldn't have been able to drive all by night long burning the headlights. And so uh, they uh, came in and they said the headlights don't work. And I took the headlight switch out. And the headlight switch was all destroyed. And it was a little switch like that. It was all burned up like that right there. And so I said, well, these lights were obviously pulling too much current driving all night long. The piece of information they gave us that was crucial was that it was an all-night drive with the lights on. And so I said, we don't want this happening to them again. So I got one of my little green fuel pump relays like the older Ford Eek systems used. And there was plenty of room in there behind that headlight switch and I mounted that relay. Uh, because see, the power that's coming out of the headlight switch goes to the... To the uh, well, the function switch so you can brighten and dim your lights. So all I needed to do was get uh, that load off of that headlight switch and to be carried by a relay. So I mounted a relay. I let the headlight switch turn on the relay, and then the relay was sending the power out of the multifunction switch. All the wiring was right there. It wasn't difficult to do. Of course, I had to ground the coil on the, you know, on the side of the relay. So I did that, and, and I fixed that one. Well, what was interesting was five... Six years later, uh, I had left the Ford dealership, went to teach at the college, and I got a call at the college from an engineer that worked for Ford Motor Company, and he said, I saw that you fixed the headlight that had burned up a switch on a 95, and this was in 2001, remember this now, on a 95 Ford Explorer, and I said, yeah, I remember that. And uh, he says, uh, well, I have gotten a right a field fix for a bunch of cars in Europe that are doing that. And I would just like to know how you did this because I know it. I noticed it never came back with the problem again. And so I was thinking, this guy's an engineer. Um, of course, I had the you know, vehicle right there in front of me. There's a little bit of difference with that. But he had to write a fuel fix for those European cars. And so he gave me an email address. And what I did was I drew him a schematic of what I did and how I did it so that he could actually do that. And I never saw the field fix that he wrote. I don't know if he used what I told him or not, but he seemed really happy with it. But here's what I did. This was the existing circuit. Now that's not, you know, you're probably, I would like to blow that up bigger, uh, but you're stuck with it the size that it is. I could blow it up bigger, it would have been a lot of trouble. Because I wanted to keep my slides working together. Cut the wire right there, coming from the headlight switch to the multifunction switch. That red yellow wire. Okay. Connect the switch to the high side of the coil. Alright, this side of the coil is going to be grounded. Alright. Then I connected the normally open to this. 
and then I brought power from the existing fuse to there. And that enabled that relay to carry the load that was previously being carried by the switch. Now the only thing the switch is carrying is that little coil. See? And so never gave any trouble again. The switch was fat, dumb, and happy the rest of his life, I guess. I don't know where that vehicle is now. Alright, so that's the schematic I sent to the Ford engineer and he t acted like he was going to use that to write a field fix for some Ford vehicles in Europe. Alright, pay close attention to harness routing. This is a picture I took under the uh, underneath a uh, Ford Focus, I think it was. And this, if you just look at a lot of times you can see it if you're familiar with looking around under there. But when you see this right here, I lay it over against that hot EGR valve and it burns those wires like that. That particular one threw me a code for an alternator field issue. And that little light blue wire was going out of the alternator. The PCM control the alternator on that one. Uh, pinched wires, sometimes uh, whenever there's a wire that's pinched because somebody put a transmission back in and weren't paying attention to where the harness is ran or something like that. You run into issues like that. And you can have them chafing. This is an actual photo of one that I took where that harness had been chafing against that AC line and the engine torquing had rubbed that uh, divot in that uh, harness or a divot, I guess you'd call it. To, and it got into all kinds of wires. They won't always have the same symptom in a situation like this. But what you will find you can look at that and see how long that thing had been rubbing here. Uh, it was eventually going to rub a hole in that AC line, uh, but as it was, it got into the wires first. That is fairly common. You know, whenever the 6 liter first came out, there was all kinds of wire chafing issues all over the engine compartment on that one. And it, this is specifically, you know, most of the time they're pretty good at, at running those uh, wires, but occasionally something gets away. Now these old cracked insulation junk like I used to see on these uh, some of these uh, uh, Mazda clones, you know, like the Ford Contour and all, uh, which incidentally Ford Contour was the first one that came out with the cabin air filter, as I remember. Uh, and it also had variable valve timing to do away with EGR. It would close the valves, the exhaust valve sooner so that some of the exhaust gas would be trapped in there and they would deal with uh, oxides of nitrogen that way. But anyway, Ford Contours had a Japanese wire and it was really bad like that. And these wires would short out and it was a really nasty problem. And so the entire engine harness had to be replaced on those little cars. And there was a recall, or it was actually a program, uh, 99M03. And it basically was talking about uh, extended coverage on under here hood wire for 10 years or 100,000 miles. If you have one beyond that, I mean, this was a big wire harness that ran all over the place. It went under the dash and everywhere. It was really a big job. Some of the guys really enjoyed that. Then some of these that bend a lot. You know, this, uh, this particular wire connector here you see was on an 06 Impala. And uh, the girl uh, called me over and she said, my car, I can't put my car in gear. It's just locked in park. And so the first thing I did is I went over there and I uh, made sure the stoplights worked, you know. And, uh, and then I went to the uh, plugged in scan tool and the body controller gets the stoplight signal. So I saw that when I mashed the brake, the stoplights were the signal was making it to the body controller. The stoplights were actually coming on. Of course, one, either one of those tests would have worked with that. Uh, and I got to looking down through there, and this little uh, solenoid, that, you know, shift lock solenoid, uh, had whenever it, every time she went back and forth in and out of park, it was bending those wires a little bit. And finally, they broke off, just like you see right there. I had seen that repeatedly on some of the older Ford stoplight switches. But every time you'd mash the brake, it would bend the wire right there at the stoplight. And uh, when we stoplight switch, and it would break it, and then all of a sudden the car won't go in gear. You know, it's a very similar situation. But that's what was going on right there. Now, if you fix this the right way, you can do it so that it looks surgical and factory. Of course, you got to remember where the wires go back. But I took these out of here. And what I did was, rather than uncrimping it, I just actually opened this crimp up. And then I laid that wire real close along the existing, what was left over from the old crimp, and I soldered it. And when you do it that way, and you do it the right way, and you put your weather pack back on there, you can snap that thing right back in there just like it was originally. And then what I typically do on that is I wind the wire up in a sort of a coil so that whenever they're doing this, that coil, that coiled wire that I, you know, coil that I made in the wire will take up the, uh, the bending, and it won't be as likely to bend and break like it did on that one there. Um, 
These connections here that are close to the battery, that one there was not easy to spot. And this manifested itself as a speedometer that wouldn't work in a transmission that wouldn't shift on a 97 Escort, believe it or not. Somebody had already put a, 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 a vehicle speed sensor on it and it didn't fix it. And so I, I got to looking for it and uh, I didn't have any communication with my scan tool. Um, but it turned out, you know, uh, you, pin 16 is your power at your DLC, pins 4 and 5 are ground. One of those, I don't remember which one, didn't have ground. And when I tracked it back to where it went, that same ground, which was at the battery, actually fed the vehicle speed sensor and the DLC under the dash. And that's why the transmission wouldn't shift, that's why the speedometer didn't work, and that's why the scan tool wouldn't talk. Because it didn't have a ground on that particular wire right there. So basically what I did with this is I clipped out this chalky garbage and I put wires in there and I soldered and heat shrinked them and all that. You couldn't unplug it there anymore, but who cares? It was for assembly anyway. You know? um, fan or blower circuits tend to do this kind of stuff. They'll actually start to develop heat and they'll begin to oxidize and the more they oxidize, the hotter they get. And the hotter they get, the more they oxidize and they start to get more resistance and they finally melt down and no current's flowing anymore. That's just the way these things do sometimes. Uh, this right here was the blower relay and connector off of a uh, uh, Pontiac, not that funky van, I forgot what they call it, like an old mobile silhouette, I, think, I guess, and uh, maybe, a, a minute. maybe an old mobile silhouette or Pontiac Montana, I don't remember, but anyway, the blower quit working, that's what was wrong with it. The uh, radiator fan quit working and burned this fuse up on a 2004 uh, Sebring, and this one right here, was the uh, was on a Chevrolet pickup? It was the blower motor resistor, and you know that's one of the first places I go if I've got a blower motor uh, that uh, quits working. I'm going to go in there and see if those wires are melted. And all kinds of cars will do this. Um, there was a uh, doggone uh, Land Rover we looked at uh, that the blower motor wouldn't work anymore because the circuit in the fuse panel that was feeding the blower motor relay had died in the fuse panel and we actually pulled wire from a fused uh, you know a fused wire feed from the battery in through the uh, bulkhead down there to that relay and we fed it that way bypassing that fuse panel because nothing else wrong with the fuse panel and the customer didn't want to buy a fuse panel for a Land Rover um, but uh, this right here like I say this is a snowball situation where oxidation and heat makes resistance and resistance makes more heat. I had a Chrysler instructor one time that was trying to tell us that resistance didn't make heat. And I was the only one in that class of 12 guys that would take him on on that. And I kept saying, why don't they make ceramic resistors? Why don't they make resistors out of ceramic if resistance doesn't make heat? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And he kind of finally backed down off that, but I was shocked at that. But, uh, anyway, butt connectors, well, you can tin your... Um, wire and you pinch your butt connector. I do not like this kind of butt connector. I mean, I'm not saying I've never used them, but I've got to be in a real bind when I use them. I've talked about this before. Uh, this one right here, I really like these kind because whenever you put it in there and pinch it, then you take your lighter and you can suck these down and they actually prevent the oxidation like I was talking about in the previous slide. That oxidation happens with butt connectors too. But if you keep the oxygen out, you don't get oxidation, right? Okay, so here you go. Alright, that's my little, uh, I actually designed this little thing right here to hold the wires while you're soldering them. Make sure you put your shrink tubing on there first. Uh, but when you've got that thing on there, it, may, it acts as a heat sink to keep it from melting your heat shrink. It holds it in place and you can solder it and then when you slide your heat shrink over it, you don't have a big bump there where you actually tied the stuff together and then soldered it. And it holds it very securely. I kind of got this idea from this helping hands thing. They used to sell at Radio Shack, and you can buy them at uh, Harbor Freight now. But I got to thinking, well, I don't really need all of these, you know, uh, joints and everything with those things. Why don't I just get a, one piece of wire? I sent that off to Ford's Best Idea Contest with Service Life Magazine, won $100. But anyway, I, I taught my students when I was teaching over to college to use this kind of thing for helping them hold the wires while they're soldering. I mean, you would believe how handy that is, you know. Uh, and it doesn't cost much of anything. That's the best part of it. Uh, all right, so wire harness overlays are a good fix if you've done right. If you're going to do a wire harness overlay rather than tracking down and splitting the harness as thick as your wrist to find the one wire 
you know that's crappy, uh, then you're a whole lot better off to go ahead and just, if you know that that's the only place the wire goes is from point A to point B, this works. But if it branches off, I've talked about this before too, but pull you that wire through a piece of loom and make sure you route it so it's not going to get wrapped around the drive so you have to burn it on the exhaust or something and make it look as factory as you can because every job is a picture of the person that did it. Remember that. Okay. But anyway, if you're needing to run a wire like that, make sure you do it in a way that, you know, that, that makes sense. Don't just throw it across the top of the engine or something like that unless it's a temporary thing just to see if that's going to work. When you've thrown your wires across the top of the engine you found out it did work, that's whenever you take this stuff and run them down right through there so they won't get caught up in the belts or whatever. But make, sure, make sure you run them through loom. Don't let wires be out there moving around freely under the hood because that loom keeps them usually from getting chafed and shorted out. Alright, this Thunderbird had a different problem. This one quit and wouldn't restart. It belonged to an FBI, well an ex, a retired FBI man that had a bail bondsman service or something. And this Thunderbird had the V6, I mean, had the V8 in it, the 4.6, and he was really happy with it. But it quit when it wouldn't start. It's a weird thing. Not the first, not the only time I've ever seen anything like this either, but it was very strange. All right, so this right here, you might remember some of these uh, cars in the mid 90s. Or Ford had came out with this electronic distributor with ignition system, EDIS. It was a little module, and uh, it was a, more sophisticated than than the old TFI. Because you remember the old TFI had spark, spout for spark output. Well, this one here had what they call spark angle word, so that whenever the PCM would request a particular timing angle, this thing here would decide whether it was going to give it to it or not. You know, long short story short, this one didn't require any kind of a heat sink. It could fire the coils without you know overheating and all that. Uh, so, and that's this module right here, that ignition control module, and it actually had this uh, uh, this wire right here going to the, uh, or it might have been that one. One of these two wires, I can't remember which one of them was, but I think it was that one, but it could have been, could have been that one. Uh, may have been the PIP wire. For some strange reason, I was thinking it was that wire, but I think it was this one here, actually, in spite of the fact that I've got that one drawn there. Okay. Uh, when I hooked up my, well, there's your EDIS-8 module. There it is unplugged. And the module was up here, and the engine controller was back here, and it went through this little uh, loom that went over the top, and it was wrapped in foil, you know, it was a grounded, shielded wire. Alright, so uh, that was going here. Right, that was it, right there. So that was your, that's your block schematic of it. There's your little connector for that, and there's your PCM connector. This is the only wire we give a rip about. That's the one that was given the problem. Well, what happened was, um, we uh, that that's where it was. I mean, that's another picture of a different car, but that's where that's where that wire runs on that Thunderbird. I hooked up this old service bay diagnostic system machine. That's like my best friend for about ten years, and uh, I could uh, toy with this flat loom over here while I had this connected to troubleshoot that circuit, and they had special connectors for troubleshooting that circuit and it would make you a little red symbol whenever it saw an open circuit there. And as I wiggled them wires right up on top of that shock tower, that connection would come and go. And I said, you know, that is really strange. And so what I did was I disconnected, I unhooked the, uh, wi the wire from the uh, ignition module, and I unhooked the wire from the engine controller, because it didn't go anywhere else, and I untaped all that foil tape off of it, and I got that wire in my hand, and I absolutely couldn't find anything wrong with that wire. I ohmed it out. I looked at it from one end to the other. There was nothing going on with it. But it was somewhere right in the middle of that wire where this was taking place. Because uh, moving that, I wasn't moving anything else. So I actually got a couple of brand new connectors, and I soldered them onto the end of that wire, made it the same length, and I pulled it through there, put the tape around it, made it just like factory, clicked it back in there, and that car started and ran and never, never acted up again. And, uh, I don't know how many times some of you guys have had a no start or something that didn't work and you unplug and uh, plug back in the uh, a relay or a connector or something and it wakes up and goes, you know, problem goes away. I always hate that kind of thing. In this case, I was able to track it down. Now, I will tell you it would have been a lot harder without the service bay diagnostic system, which is not there anymore. It's gone. All right, that one was fixed. Now we're going to whip our way through a test track quick. 
All right. Using a digital multimeter function to check the volt for voltage drop, the meter lead should be connected in which of the following ways? What do you think? And we're talking about the voltage. You know, you can measure voltage drop either on the positive or the negative side. Well, let's just say that we're on the positive side this time. Probably answered the question for you when I said that. Which of the following is correct regarding a series circuit? A. Each load has its own ground. B. The circuit must travel through all the loads to find ground. C. More loads uh, added means more current flow. And D. Highest resistance has the lowest voltage drop. What in the world is that? All right. When a digital multimeter is used to measure DC voltage and is connected in parallel with the load device, that means you're hooking it up. Power for ground right there. Which of the following defines the reading? Amp, voltage drop, voltage spike, pulse width modulation. Which of the following tools can be used to check the continuity of wires that carry digital signals? Meg meter, amp meter, logic probe, DVOM. Using a digital multimeter, a fully charged 12 volt battery should indicate how much voltage on the open circuit test. 9.6, 4 volts per cell, 1 volt per cell, 12.6 volts. Two technicians are discussing a battery state of charge. Technician A says a specific gravity of 1225, at, you know, 1.225 at 80 degrees Fahrenheit indicates a battery state of charge is approximately 75 cents. Reverse cents, excuse me. Technician B says you can use a hydrometer to check battery state of charge on a maintenance-free battery if it has cell caps. Who's right? A only, B only, A and B, or neither A and B. When performing a load test on a battery, a technician finds the battery voltage drops below specifications. Now that means that you went for half the cold cranking amps for 15 seconds and it wasn't supposed to go below 9.6, right? Uh, something, another way you can do that is you can uh, disable the ignition in the fuel and spin it for 15 seconds. Looking at the voltage while you're spinning it. It shouldn't go below 9.6. That basically checks it to see if it's suitable for that particular car. Okay. So what do you do here? Recharge and re return it to service. Recharge and retest. Replace the battery. Replace the voltage regulator. Two technicians are discussing an alternator with zero output. Technician A says the fuel circuit may be open. Technician B says the fusible link may be open to the battery from the battery of the alternator. Who's correct about that? Think about that for a minute. Which part of an alternator is included in the field circuit? A, the stator, B, the rotor, C, the rectifier, D, the housing. Charge the system fee and check for non-output. Technician A notices a strong magnetic field at the rear bearing on the alternator and claims the brushes are the problem. Technician B says the field is energized so the problem may be due to charging system voltage drop. Who's correct? A, B, both or neither. Let's start over. You do that on the positive side of the circuit. Now, if you're checking for voltage drop on the negative side of the circuit, you're going to do it on both on negative. But they're both going to be on the same side of the circuit. You're not going to go from positive to negative when you're doing a voltage drop test on a, you know, if you're checking for battery cables or whatever. All right. Current's got to travel through all the loads to find ground. When a digital multimeter is used to measure, you're actually measuring voltage drop across the device. Like if you've got a light bulb or a fan or something, you go from the positive to the negative side of that connector going to that thing, you're seeing how much voltage is being dropped across that load. Uh, which of the following tools can be used to check the continuity of wires that carry digital signals? Well, you're supposed to use DVOM for that. Uh, fully charged 12 volt battery should have 12.6 volts if you're just looking at volts. All right, then this one here would be B only. Uh, hydrometer uh, if, uh, if it has cell caps, but hydrometer doesn't really work as good. I like to use a refractometer, you know, the one like you check your coolant uh, level, you know, specific gravity with. Well, I think that works better really than them silly hydrometers. Um, I, I do like the one that measures cold cranking amps, and I've got one of those. I may demonstrate for y'all on one of these videos one day. When performing a load test on a battery, technician finds the battery voltage drop below specs. You recharge the battery and retest it. It's probably going to need a battery anyway if you're going by cold cranking amps. But um, anyway, uh, two technicians are discussing an alternator with zero output. Uh, technician A says the field circuit may be open. B says the fusible link may be open for battery alternator, both A and B. Um, 
So the field circuit being open would cause that. The rotor is the field circuit, the part that spins on the inside.